Okay, so we're recording uh, the meeting. Welcome, everybody. We're going to call our school board meeting of August 21st to order uh, exactly 6.15. Thank you for making the time to be here. It's the summer is running away from us, so it's another day that you get to spend here, but on behalf of all our kids, so that's exciting. So I was going to start today not with the same welcome that we did for the configuration committee, but with a different welcome. But I just want to check first that you can hear me, especially people online. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I think some had not. OK, my name is Flor Diaz Smith. I'm just going to say my name once today because it's the beginning of the school in the school year. I have the privilege and the honor to chair this wonderful board and group of people and to partner with our new superintendent but all a colleague and friend of <laughs> so in order to paint a picture of what we are trying to do as a district and achieve our and and understand what we want to do with our resources we need to have a good understanding of our vision mission and core beliefs so as you all know, we spent all of last year, basically a year, and we approved our strategic plan just as the closing of last year, you know, just about then. So, and we did that after a year and a half long of, you know, reaching out to our communities, talking with staff, talking with students, and talking to us as a board to what we believe. So having a strong collective vision of what we want for our children is critical. So these core beliefs, I'm just gonna read them quickly, the humanity and justice and community belonging, well-being, rigorous curriculum and instruction, commitment, uh, community engagement and relationships and transparent and responsible leadership uh, are things that I'm hoping that we can uh, lean on today as we, uh, as we talk about what criteria we're thinking for our configuration and as we walk through our meeting today. Uh, this core beliefs will give uh, our leadership team and the staff and our board uh, some guidance on how to follow those action steps that we talked about our retreat to, uh, while also grounding the work on behalf of all of our students. So uh, let's use them. And as a board, I hope that we can start a year by um, sort of modeling uh, for our for our kids. You know what good. It, listening and democracy means for all of us, us being here listening to all voices there's multiple truths and uh, we have a responsibility to or, or a role I, I would say to establish a, a district climate of trust and collaboration and respect and mutual respect of all so as we start a year it, it's exciting and uh, we'll soon have kids here next week so with that any changes to the agenda <laughs> Nope. Okay. Reception of guests. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you for people online, too. Uh, and thank you for our administrators that always make the time to be here with us. And I know it's another night that you add and another work, but we know how much you love our students and our community. So thank you for those that are online and present here with us. And thank you, Tim, for stepping up. And Orca, too, you're always here to help us spread. Uh, the word of what we are doing here. So any public comments at this moment? We will have time right now and we will have time at the end of the meeting. If you have a comment today, we, I'm gonna just check how many hands I have online. I have one, two, three, four hands online and one here. here. So we will do two minutes as I said to you, so if we had less than 10 people, we would do 10 minutes. And if we had more than 10 people, we would do the one and a half that we have here. So with that, I'm going to open it up to the public here because we just have one and then we'll move directly online so that we can walk through that lineup. So if you don't mind standing and saying your name and then go ahead. Hi, my name is Nat Shambaugh. I'm from Berlin. Uh, my kids went through school here 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and I went to the June meeting in Berlin about the configuration and I have a couple of questions that I, I haven't been able to clarify by looking at your information online, and I'll, I'll be quick. But uh, first, thank you for everything you all are doing. Uh, it's a thankless job to try and figure out how to reconfigure this whole thing. But it's got to be done, I think. Uh, I think it's beyond time to consolidate some and, and uh, not have such small classroom sizes that the kids 
don't have an opportunity to do new and different classes. Um, so questions I have are uh, the June meetings and the surveys you did uh, are summarized online, but I don't see anywhere where you're actually figuring out how to incorporate any of that into what you're going to do moving forward. So if you can clarify that. Um, at the June meeting, uh, we were told that there was going to be uh, financial modeling by August on what the different <laughs> uh, scenarios might actually cost. And I haven't found any sign of that anywhere online. And so I could, would like to be able to see how that's playing out. Um, my understanding was that there was going to be uh, a vote in November potentially on closing one or more schools. Uh, but the most I could find online was your September 18th meeting where there's a decision to vote on configuration priorities. And I don't know what that means. A decision to vote, does that mean you're going to vote on September 18th on configuration priorities or you're going to decide that it's time to think about voting? Um, so I think you need to move along as quickly as you can because this process I don't think should be delayed beyond this year to try and figure it out. And on that note, uh, I haven't been able to hear from anybody a coherent statement on what happens if or when the towns vote not to close their school. How are you going to move forward if you decide that schools should close but the towns decide they shouldn't? Uh, and financially, we still need to move forward on something. That's it. Thank you very much. And we'll, we'll get to all of that, hopefully, through the meeting. Uh, now I'm going to move to our online. Uh, so uh, Lisa, do you want to get us started? I don't know if it, because I know you guys have uh, uh, a list. I'm going to actually let Lila go first and then let you guys do your group. Is that OK? OK. It's just to reach out. OK, Lila, go first. OK, Lila Richardson. Um, I'm a Hold community on member. Second. Can we the volume just a little bit? More a lot. <laughs> I don't know. Try again. Lila Richardson, um, I'm a community Lila member. Yeah, just hold on well. one second, Lila. We're just trying to adjust the volume mm -hmm. so that we can hear you. You're OK. You're unmuted. It's just very, very low. Lila, Go ahead. Can you speak for just a moment? Oh. <laughs> Lila Richardson from Worcester. Hold on one second. Yeah, it's coming through there and not through. Otherwise, I'll do what I did the last time and just unmute mine. Okay. All right, Lila, I'm going to ask you just to try it one more time. Okay. And it's Lila Richardson from Worcester. Yes, Yay. we got you. <laughs> got it? Okay. Um, as, as part of the community survey on reconfiguration, the board solicited questions from the community. Um, we're glad to hear that some of our questions will be addressed in this and upcoming meetings. Uh, since we have not yet received concrete data on finances, capacity, community impact, and other key questions, we've attempted to piece together our own answers to some of our questions based on the data made available to, by the board thus far. The answers may not be wholly accurate, but they're the best we could come up with with the information currently available. Uh, four or five of us will be reading the rest of the document, depending on timing, and Lisa Hanna would be the next person in line. If it's possible to call on us in that order, we'd appreciate it. Um, we've also emailed a copy of the document that we're uh, testifying from to the full board and a link to, to our calculations and sources. Uh, we'd first like to talk about school capacity and student population density in the three elementary school reconfiguration model. In the April reconfiguration packet, the board suggested that the maximum capacity of Rumney with nine classrooms is 268 students. By these calculations, each classroom at maximum capacity would hold approximately 30 students, which well exceeds state educational quality standards and our district's own standards. Similar discrepancies exist in the maximum capacity calculations of the other elementary schools. 
And so, so how are these numbers determined? Our calculations based on state educational quality standards estimate a maximum capacity of approximately 200 students at Rumney. If all the Doty students attended Rumney, including the sixth grade in FY26, Rumney would be at 92.5% capacity. If the sixth grade were moved to U32, the Rumney capacity would be 81%. In FY24, Rumney was at 61% capacity. We asked the Middlesex residents really want to add a third or more students and change the feel of their school to that degree. And does this capacity level leave room for fluctuating populations in the future? So I think that's my two minutes and yes. I'll pass on to Lisa You're if that's right. okay. Right on time. Okay, so I'll let you guys go through. I'm not gonna try to attempt. So go ahead, Lisa. I'll go next. Um, Lisa Hanna, Worcester resident and parent. Um, so our fourth point, in the board's April reconfiguration packet, a combined Rumney Doty school in Middlesex would have 10 classes located in nine classrooms. Assuming that two of those classes are a morning and afternoon pre-K, where would, where would the community connections pre-K students be while the other students are in the pre-K classroom? Would reconfiguration do away with pre-K community connections altogether? Does the three elementary school reconfiguration model also account for classrooms for art, music, foreign language, and other, quote, expanded enrichment opportunities? Are there actually enough classrooms for this recon reconfiguration model? The coming school year, the administration has chosen to send the Doty pre-K population to Rumney, which is an interesting experiment in reconfiguration. The current 24-25 pre-K plan at Rumney is that there will be 18 pre-K children in a classroom with four teachers. While technically legal, this scenario may be unviable for some young children with sensitive ears and nervous systems. Have you ever spent time in a room with 18, three and four year olds for an extended period of time? What does this experiment forecast about the education quality of our children under reconfiguration? In the board's April reconfiguration, it showed that the current rate of population decline in our five elementary schools between FY22 and 26 are 6% at Doty, which is actually a fluctuation rather than a decline, 9% in Berlin, 17% in Calais, 22% at Romney, and 29% in East Montpelier. At the current rate, in 10 years, East Montpelier would have 29 students, while Doty would have 64. Why are the two towns with the highest rates of population decline the ones who would get to keep their schools in the three elementary school reconfiguration model? Why are we not talking about closing East Montpelier and Romney instead? And I'll pass it on to our next speaker. Thank you, Rachel. Or who is that it? Hi, I'm Kaylin Hawanski, a Worcester resident and parent. Now we would like to talk about how much money would actually be saved by closing Doty. Based on rough numbers provided by the board, our, calculation est our calculations estimate that approximately $796,000 would be saved annually by closing Doty, including FTEs, average capital expenses, and building operation costs, but not including other unknowns. This represents approximately 2.3% of the fiscal year 25 budget, which would save the district some money. However, when expenses increase again the following year, what is to stop the board and administration from closing your community school next? The board has already expressed that the entire district's elementary population could fit into one school with some capital improvements. What would happen to expanded enrichment, expanded enrichment opportunities in the next budget crisis? How, would closing, how much would closing Doty impact local education property taxes based on fiscal year 25 budget calculations? Annually, per $100,000 house value and not accounting for income sensitivity, residents would save $86 in Berlin, $49 in Calais, $85 in East Montpelier, and $66 in Middlesex, and $33 in Worcester. While not nothing, this could be the cost of going out to dinner for some families. Is this level of savings really worth the impact of closing dirty on the well-being of the children of the community of Worcester? Does this kind of savings really solve our budgetary issues? How much expenditure would be saved by closing Doty, Doty versus how much revenue would be gained by merging with Montpelier and having Montpelier students attend U32? If by closing Doty, the district would save 796,000 or 2.3% of the fiscal year 25 budget, the revenue generated by welcoming Montpelier high school students out of the flood zone would be approximately $9,936,000 or 29% of the fiscal year 25 budget. There would likely be significant administrative savings as well. Why is the board not spending more time, of it, more of its time exploring the Montpelier merger instead? And I'll pass to our next reader. Noah Weinstein, Worcester resident and parent of a child at Doty. I'll be the last reader. 
The amount of annual capital spending on the Doty building is estimated at approximately $228,000 per year. Given the extensive capital repairs invested in Doty this summer for a new generator, drainage, and security systems, as well as the new windows, insulation, and siding done several years ago, are there actually additional significant capital improvement projects planned for Doty in the next five years? Why was so much money invested by the district in a building that may not be owned by the district in a year? We'd now like to address the equity and income disparity issues. Worcester has the highest percentage of students on free and reduced lunch and the lowest median income of all five towns. With regards to equity, what would be the impact of closing an elementary school in the town with the highest rate of poverty in the district? How would this affect property values, town property taxes, the future viability of the town economy, and the well-being of the students who are embedded in that community? Would the board really be representing and supporting all of our students and communities as stated in the core values? And lastly, if the board commits to honoring a town's vote regarding the closure of its own school and then allows the vote to, to occur, occur, here is one possible outcome. It seems likely that Worcester may vote to keep Doty open. It also seems possible that Callis may vote to close Callis Elementary. In this scenario, Worcester would keep getting would get to keep the school located at the heart of its town, which we want. Callis students could potentially get school choice, perhaps with some families choosing to send their students to East Montpelier and others to Doty, boosting the populations at both schools. East Montpelier could get additional students, which they desperately need in order to maintain the viability of their school. Middlesex would get to maintain the feel of their school and avoid overcrowded classrooms and hallways. Berlin would get to keep its school and not have it turned into an early childhood center and the board and taxpayers would get a reduction in costs. While not a perfect solution, the four elementary school compromise could be seen as a win-win-win-win-win for our district. Is the administration considering modeling this option or <laughs> other options that the community generated when you asked us for alternative ideas? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. No. Okay. Uh, Rachel? Hi, my name is Rachel Seelig. I'm a resident of Callis and a product of our district schools, graduating way back in 2001. For about eight years, I worked in the disability rights field, doing a lot of work in special education. I've also worked in preschool, elementary, and middle schools. Um, while I'm a member of the Callis Planning Commission, my comments tonight are my own and focus on this issue of school closures, which our board and our district leadership persists in calling configuration. Our superintendent wrote in his letter in the board packet about the factors he believes that mean that now is the time uh, to have this discussion. There is, however, a significant difference between gathering information and analysis and discussing what is best for our students and towns and plowing forward with a plan that has not been considered from all perspectives based on a study whose goal was not to improve our students' educational outcomes alone, but to have fewer than five elementary schools. At this time, I believe that there are too many unanalyzed variables for this board to make any kind of recommendation to voters that is based on thorough analysis in the current timetable of this and two more board meetings. It is just fundamentally inadequate to gather this information. I've previously shared through Daniel Keeney my thoughts on the information that is missing that the board and all voters deserve to have before jumping to the conclusion that any of our schools should be shuttered. I understand that comment may not have been added to the public record, so I would like to summarize it this evening. Analysis of early childhood opportunities and trends to understand whether providing child care to zero to three in our schools could provide an economic benefit to the district modeling K through eight schools in our elementary schools, modeling districts, the district merging with nearby district, um, considering outreach to choice towns to invite their students to tuition to our schools, mm -hmm. modeling the opportunity to develop an in-district therapeutic or multiple therapeutic programs open to surrounding districts uh, for placements for students with disabilities. Uh, to increase the census, especially given that there is a moratorium on development of new independent schools and many children sitting at home waiting for placements. Analysis of students who are not anticipated to be successful learners if placed in larger classrooms. Analysis of added costs of school closures. 
Um, this one is new from when I emailed Daniel. Analysis of staff and teacher transfers and the impact on teacher and staff retention of school closures. Economic analysis of the expected impact on our grand lists in our towns, on healthcare costs for staff and students, and our economies in our towns that will lose schools, not just short term, but long term. Health impact analyses, economic analyses uh, for the school budget, environmental impact analyses, Opportunities to reduce costs through energy efficiency, analysis of zoning by proximity to building rather than application of town boundaries, analysis of uh, the assumption that school closures will actually allow for a reduction in non-classroom teaching staff, analysis of likelihood of further district consolidation with or without consent by the state. Um, oh, and I see my time has concluded um, I would ask that you uh, review the full list and some of the additional details that I provided to Daniel back at the end of June, early July. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Any others in the public? Seeing none, uh, we're gonna we're gonna move uh, right into our board operations. And our first item of today is our school board interview for our Worcester uh, board member. And she is uh, interviewing online be uh, because she unfortunately couldn't be here with us today. But we're going to get started with with that. So maybe Tim, if oh yeah, it's to speaker right now so that we can see her there. So uh, Julia, welcome. Uh, thank you for for being here. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, Guys, and now we can see you. Yeah, I was just trying okay. to. Okay. Oh. All right. Sure. So uh, I email you uh, the, the questions uh, ahead of time and I what I figure because not just because of timing, but because we have one candidate with us today is that if you wouldn't mind just summarizing uh, the for what you know what motivates you to want to become a school board member what uh, particular skills and experiences you're hoping to share with us as you served and and then go down uh, that list and why are you interested in the board to serve at this particular time and and if you're willing to attend uh, board development yes so, of course. you don't mind just summarizing that instead of going question by question sure okay? sure i can try to do that so thanks for Thank having you. me here today nice to see everybody um so education, as you may know, if you read my letter and took a quick look at my resume, education has been critical to my uh, whole life's journey. My father was a teacher from the time I was born until almost until the time he died. My mom was a teacher, too. And one of the core beliefs that I've developed over time is not anything profound, but I really believe that education is the key to uh, success for us all in life. And I'd like very much to be part of a team working for toward this for all the students in our in our district. I heard I heard something uh, last night that Michelle Obama said at the convention. She said, and I loved it because it was so connected to this. She said, "We have the power to marry our hope with our action," and I think that that is pertinent to um, to me and wanting that, you know, hoping for this uh, success for all children, being able to take some action toward that would be would be important. So I've lived in this school district since 1985. I lived in Middlesex and then I moved to Worcester. And at this at this point at, in my life, after 33 years teaching in, in public education, um, I'm retired partially. I'm uh, I'm an adjunct professor at a community college based in Connecticut, but I have more time available than I ever had uh, previously, and it seems that now is a good time to uh, serve my community by by fleshing out the Worcester representation since we only have two people representing Worcester on a unified board right now. Um, especially at this crossroads in light of discussion of, uh, of reconfiguration options, it seemed like a, a good time to, to uh, take that leap and become someone who's able to serve in this capacity. Um, I've been dedicated to all kinds of community service for, for a long, long time. I'm a hospice volunteer. I serve on the board of the Historical Society. The, I'm part of the Worcester Neighbor Network and serve on the Justice and Action Committee at the Old Meeting House in East Montpelier. So that, 
I think shows my dedication to serving uh, various parts of the community. I, I work well with other people. I can listen. I can, uh, I feel like I'm a good communicator. I'm a, I teach writing, so that's another skill. Um, and I believe that I'm also working toward always finding solutions for the common good. Um, and I can follow through with any commitment that I, that I take on. So that's, that's all it in a nutshell, I guess. I, that's pretty quick summary, but I hope I answered all the questions. Thank you, Julia. I, I think you, I think you did. Is there any follow up from, from the board? So we have two options. We can, you know, we can ask an extra question, or we can go into executive session and deliberate. We have one candidate, which has been our our policy. So I think we should follow, and we can just move to the next room and come right back. So I would ask for a motion to move into executive session to deliberate. Second. So move. Patrick. Second. Move. Second by Chris. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 We're gonna move next door, uh, and I'm gonna bring you. Oh, actually, I'm gonna call both of you. Okay. It was moved by Elizabeth to come out of executive session and seconded by Keith. Thank you. And and now I'm looking for a motion uh, for our new board member. Could I have a motion? I move to appoint Julia Hewitt to the school board representing the town of Worcester. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Galen, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, welcome. Hey, Julia, you will hear from me. Thank you for your willingness to serve. And like I said in my email, you're, you're, uh, you're more than welcome to stay through the meeting and, and stay informed. Uh, Melissa is going to reach out to you. Unfortunately, we can't do the oath online. Uh, so when, when you get back, uh, please make sure that you get the oath of office, and then you can uh, make decisions with us at our next meeting, thank, okay? Thank you so much. I wasn't expecting applause. That was just really a, <laughs> a, really, a really sweet surprise. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. It'd be, it'll, it'll be a, a good journey together. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So with that, let's move right into we're just on 3.2, our configuration uh, committee uh, committee work. Uh, there's a little table in the in your packet. Do you see it? Oh, it was separate. This thing? Yes. Yes, it was a, it yeah, was a separate. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, it's not in your packet. Sorry. Yeah, is there anybody? Just the, so I'm going to give you just two minutes or three minutes when I see that heads are up just to look at it. Yeah, sure, we can. Yeah, yeah. I send the, the link, but yeah. And then I should probably post the link here for people that haven't been able to see it. One second. I just pasted the link on the chat for people to be able to look at the criteria.
I see most heads up, so everybody had a chance to, to review them. So I, I was going to just do a quick reminder of how we how we got how we got here for those that were not able to be here. So we, as, as you know, we send those uh, surveys out. We had community forums on, in person and online, and we gathered data. Uh, part of your packet, uh, our last packet from the Finance Committee and Configuration Committee had the full set of data. Your the, they, they packet today had the full set of data. There's also some synthesized data uh, in there uh, that uh, Jeannie helped us put together. And then we had a meeting uh, before that, and we went through uh, a protocol to sort of come up with some criteria. At our Monday meeting, we we had this table. Everybody saw this table for the first time, which attempted to synthesize the information that we had heard at the at the meeting. And then the uh, configuration committee was able to give us some some feedback. And and then what you see in red there is what uh, what we added from and it's said it above, right? So the revised criteria is what we looked at in eight nineteen. And, and those, again, this is not finalized, but our job today is to finalize it <laughs> yeah, right now. I, we added another, another column, and I don't want to get lost in the weeds of that last column. It's just a way for us to later on talk about that, but it seemed that it was, there were some things that we were talking about that sort of fit in there and helps us make, will help us make decisions. And hopefully, today, right now, I'm hoping that we can just stay concentrated on the criteria, not the timeline, right? So the criteria, how are we gonna, how, this is what we're gonna give to our leadership team for them to be able to come back to us with some, uh, with some uh, modeling, some options. There's also a little, uh, there's like five bullets uh, at the end that it was just uh, things that were said, but not necessarily belonged in the, in the criteria, so just kept them uh, below there. So I, we can do it the same way that we did it at our, uh, our committee meeting, which is warm and cool feedback, uh, or we can just for timing, we can just move in into, you know, what, what, are, what are we missing from the data that you have and what we've been talking about. Is there anything else that we're missing or is there something that is not represented in the way that you would like it to be represented here? And I would really want everybody to have a chance to recording. Say, you know, like if you have no you comment, have no comment, comment. comment. That's, okay. that's okay. Everybody, just make sure you're muted. Thank you. Okay. So anybody wants to get started? Okay, we could start with warm feedback. What do you like about this? Does, does it represent? And then we're going to move into the data that Stephen presented the last time. It, you know, I don't know if you want to do it as part of the report, but it's, yeah. Oh, we've got yes. it next. You've got it next, that's true. Yeah. So is there going to be more financial data other than then? Oh, yes, definitely. Data? Okay, yes. and what will that be, and when will it be available? So we will be bringing in um, the third meeting, so this is the first, second, the third meeting um, of this series is going to be all of the financial information around um, both the budget. So we'll, we're going to bring you the, the, the level service budget for what the district is right now, and then we'll bring you a budget that shows with configuration, um, the, primarily the three uh, elementary school configuration, sixth grade to U32, but we'll be able to show a couple of options associated with that. Um, you've asked for some of the town information and um, we'll have some of that um, we've, we've talked about that in the last meeting is that we can't we can't fully break out all the expenses by town but we'll do as much as we can to yeah, show you, that when you say by town you mean school in town school in town yeah because okay. I, I think yes and that's an important distinction because sometimes we forget that the towns also have a responsibility for u32 mm -hmm. as part yeah. of the expenses yeah. um, so yeah. the, the the district budget is actually you know more than just the elementary schools yeah. Yeah. Um, can we get a um, and I saw that it was kind of a note uh, in terms of a, looking at a, a four elementary school configuration so we've heard that request and we're going to see what we can do to okay. bring you more, as much information as possible because I think that. having that before a vote as opposed to only if the town vote I, I understood school, understood would be helpful yeah, yeah. information and, yeah and and Grisana, I, I I promise you I'm not trying to be difficult but 
I, I would love to have that conversation at the end. Like if we could, con like the most important thing for us right now is to concentrate that criteria because if we don't give them the criteria, they can't model, they can't come back to us with finances. Finances. So if, if we give them the criteria, then we can talk about finances. So if we could, you know, like just try to do criteria right now. Michaela, do you want to go? Um, well, I gave feedback at the meeting on Monday, and this, this, you know, I, I think it looks much more specific and included all the feedback we've given on Monday. So I don't really have anything to add. I just want to say. Yeah, I like it because I think it brings out kind of the criteria and then action steps and how it ties into our core beliefs and values. Um, and I do feel like a lot more has been captured over the various meetings, and that feels good to see. Any other warm? I agree. I feel. I think it feels really comprehensive and answers a lot of what's been raised. Um, I think the the one thing that we had talked about that could be helpful is just having a a really solid definition of equitable opportunities because I think people have been using that in a lot of different ways and we need to all be working from the same understanding. Thank you. So I'm going to add that note. Okay. What are we missing? Any cool feedback? What are we missing? Um, so, it, are we going to get a sense as to um, what mechanism or proposed mechanism uh, that will be incorporated to uh, maintain sustainability? Because we talk about the goal being sustainability, uh, but having a mechanism that would ensure sustainability um, is, is a goal, I think. Um, just so that we're not back here again in three years, four years, um, because you know the costs are increasing again. Um, but is there any discussion on how we can, if if any school is closed uh, and there's cost savings from that, how that can be perpetuated over time, as opposed to being a short-lived event? So kind of like talking to the mic. Oh, sorry. Kind of, kind of like the uh, you know, claim savings for Act 46 to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we're talking about sustainability, we mean sustainability over time. I think. Right. So the criteria is just sustainability, and and we just need to show what does it look like over time, so you can make a decision: is is this sustainable? Right? Is this going to create the system that we want? I don't honestly, I don't know what I can prove to you yet. Well, well <laughs> so hold on. It, so, so so we're just looking at sustainability as our criteria. Right, but how you, you know how you demonstrate how will we demonstrate sustainability over time, um, and what mechanisms will we have in place so it's, to do that? Chris, would would the language that we because that's I we were trying to get to that that was the conversation that we had. So if you go into and maybe I should put numbers here, but if you go to one, two, three, four, financial <laughs> sustainability, fiscal responsibility, and what how we try to say that was resilience and responsiveness to future demographic changes or do you want to because we want to have that flexibility and then you know because the, the money is kind of separate right once uh, they have the model they will be able to demonstrate but these are these are these are, these are goal oriented as opposed to how what mechanism will we have in place to meet these goals and it sounds like it's it, you know, because we're talking about a fairly drastic remedy here um, for our current financial situation, uh, we should be able to point to something that is intended to sustain um, our, our costs uh, or, or what our rate of expenditure uh, and what that would look like. Well, I would say that that's a board's a board decision as to what kind of increases do you think are reasonable to sustain over time for our uh, communities. We, so would that become a strategy then? I, I mean, I think you know, so, so that That's, because it's not the criteria, but it, the strategy but, may be I, board considering cap on spending. And that's a, that's a board's decision, right? You're, 
for you to decide how you want to cap spending or or to look at that. So if, if the board said we don't want to spend any more than five percent annually, annual increases over time, would you be able to model that going into five I, or eight years over time? I can try. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to make a promise that I can do it that right. far out, but I can try to see what the model would be. But also know that the only thing we can control is our expenses. I can't control health care and all those kinds of things. And that's right. my point is that we're trying to be, mm -hmm. trying to give, I think, as mm -hmm. good a clear vision of what the future may look like as opposed to, well, we hope to do this or we hope to do that. Right. And, so does it make sense that uh, what I'm trying to link it to is also to our core beliefs? So does it make sense what we were trying to do there was link that to transparent and responsible leadership, right? Well, or, or or should we add a core belief? No, uh, I, th I think, I think that's yeah. No, I'm just, just like <laughs> so. So, but are are you okay? Because we can move into. I'm not trying to cut no, you. No, off. no, like, no. I just want to stay yeah. like we need the criteria for, and yeah. I'm gonna let. And I don't know if I have anybody online. So Zach and then Daniel. One way to address some of that may be looking at specific educational improvements and opportunities to split that into things that are really about spending decisions. You know, things like do you bring back Spanish, where it's hard to forecast out, and things that are really much more structural. You know, if you have more kids in a school, how can you rearrange education? How do you give choices about you know how classes are configured in a way that enhances education versus sort of be having just this be the cohort and be in you know, being pushed into that. I know some of our principals have spoken about that as being a really significant, you know, those sort of things being significant issues. Um, you see that with the arts about certain things that you can do where you just need a critical mass of students to have a band, to have a choir, those kind of things. That's, you know, I think sort of just splitting up, like that's the stuff that's really durable, you know, regardless of what happens with healthcare. And so maybe, maybe thinking about those two categories would help to address some of that. But with the just to get with the if you go we down two bullets in the implications of different proposals, we have somebody that is not muted. We have some echo. With that, it, Zach, if you're on that bullet, uh, implications of different proposals. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I think it, it partly fit, fits there. I mean, that's really focusing on on sixth grade to U thirty two. I think the sort of how do you, what what do you change by changing the structure? I think it impacts both U thirty two and the elementary schools. On this back uh, page, oh, oh, oh sorry, I didn't see. It's not. I got this at this. I think it's also here the maintain or expand yes. enrichment opportunities. Yes. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. Both of those. Yes. I think. I think I think it shouldn't be either. Either of them. Okay. Daniel? I was just going to suggest that, that in the implications uh, criterion, we change projected tax savings to cost savings and indirectly tax savings, I th just as an acknowledgement to how. Sorry, can you repeat it? So can I? Cost the, savings. Cost savings, and yeah. Indirectly tax savings. It's just to pretend that we can directly control tax savings is giving us an even more impossible yeah. task yeah. than we already have before us. So Yeah, so that's, that, so that's why we had about the per pupils. I was also spending, just gonna but... I was just gonna ask Chris if you had any specific mechanisms in mind, we should this is the time to put it in there in the financial sustainability criterion. Because I think otherwise it's mm -hmm. it's the administration's it's on it's on them to demonstrate the ways in which we're we're going to put us put ourselves in a better position to, um, you know, to influence future financial sustainability. But if we had any specific ways in which we'd like to see a model, you know, amplify that that ability and that sort of add more levers to our to our toolbox to mix things up a little bit, that this is the yeah. time to add it. If you had anything specific, because I can't really imagine how a reconfiguration other than you know reducing the overhead that we're talking about and and reducing our our physical footprint what what other ways in which are there in which the configuration might extend financial sustainability or we reduce costs right. in, in what ways and in what ways is it does it 
afford us more flexibility and more ability to contain costs in the future. I guess I, I just think, want us to be explicit, and I can't think of other ways to be explicit. I'm, well, I would think that we would um, examine what programs we offer, um, because programs are people, and, and people are the cost. Eighty percent we keep hearing eighty percent of our budget is based on not buildings but cost of personnel, uh, and the programs that we offer are delivered through personnel primarily. Uh, and so, really having a hard look at that is: are we going to keep offering everything that we do, um, or not? Uh, and if we're not, then what are we going to pay back on? Because that is the cost driver. People is the cost driver. And I'm not advocating for that, but I think that's the reality of what we're facing if we're going into the future, particularly when we have, um, you know, it doesn't look like healthcare is going to be diminishing significantly anytime soon, you know, with a third double, you know, double digit in <laughs> increase this year. Um, so just really taking a hard look of what this really may mean if we're trying to control costs. Um, and, and I think it goes to programming. Stephen may agree or not dis or, or disagree yeah. with me on that, but I think that is ultimately the, the factor that we need to look at in controlling costs, not buildings, because buildings are, if they're only 20% of the budget, it's not huge. You don't get a lot of savings there. Or, or controlling costs there. So, Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Gonna, I just I just wonder if that's I, I totally agree with you. I just wonder if that's more of a budget process question than a reconfiguration process question like there's so much stuff that they already have to answer right now. Mm -hmm. I think it probably makes sense to look at level funding versus reconfiguration and all of like understanding all of this and then we're going to have to have that discussion of if we're working with level funding or if we're working with a reconfiguration budget, what still fits in there and what do we have to cut back to get the budget through now and in the future? But maybe I'm missing your No, point no, no, no that's, yeah. uh, but uh, yeah. see, I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. No, uh, no, no, they're very much right. they're, they're connected integrated. for sure, yeah. So having that yeah. conversation, if we're um, Thinking about uh, voting to recommend closure of schools, which is a significant reconfiguration, you know, significant impact on the district. We want to be able to say we think it will do this, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and that will be sustained over time because we anticipate doing this. Rather than again, gotcha. yeah, yeah, a couple years down the road, coming back and saying, well, we have to do these other things, and then people say, well, you, you should have told us that two years ago when we yeah. voted to do things. I mean, it's just kind of modeling into the future and it's unpleasant I'm not, this isn't a pleasant conversation um, because you know we offer a lot of things to our community and our students and and we you know hope the best to continue to do that but you know given the finances i don't think we can quite frankly yeah. thank you chris uh, diane and then ursula so the one thing i'm wondering about is because as you're saying that what you're talking about is it to me doesn't fit necessarily under that financial sustainability in that criteria, but it goes to to me it says as part of maintain or expand enrichment opportunities that are consistent across the system and are fiscally sustainable or something. Right. You know, to me it's yeah. it's in those uh -huh. implication areas where we're talking about it or you know specific educational improvements and opportunities for students that are fiscally sustainable because we don't want to put something in place now right. and then next year actually those have to come out so what are we looking at saying we can offer in a fiscally sustainable mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> <laughs> i'm all set thank you thank you ursula okay so so adding that, uh, is anything else, are we feeling comfortable? Because th we need this for the leadership team to be able to move so that we can model. And you know, I, I think the public is just also getting an understanding of the, the next steps, right? Because they can bring back financials without being able to, to model and they can show us uh, any of that without this. So I would actually want a motion and I know that this is just direction, but I just want a motion to approve the criteria, the criteria as submitted. And let me just make that one last uh, uh, change. But basically what I'm adding is just the sustainability of the equitable opportunities through the years, right? 
Uh, well, and the cost savings and projected tax savings. Yeah, cost savings yeah. and indirectly tax savings mm -hmm. is what I wrote, or mm -hmm. is it projected? Sounds good. Okay. Well, for equitable opportunities yeah. and then the enrichment opportunities. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, let's let's yeah. slow down a little bit. So I'm gonna just go column by column. So the for impact of student well-being, we're good with that one, the first one, right? Yeah. Yes. Travel time, we're good with those two bullets. Yep. Implications of moving sixth graders to, you know, adding the research and data. Good. Okay. Fisc uh, financial sustainability, fiscal responsibility, resilience, and responsive to future demographic changes. Check. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, does this configuration set up to enter a merger conversation with other districts in the future? Check. Right. Implications of different proportions specific to communities. To that one, I added a bullet. The, lo the last bullet that was read. Now I have in green, it says cost savings and indirectly tax savings is what I wrote. Is that as long as it gets what I was asking for on Monday. So, so how we get there, you know, as long as this is part of, this is a criteria that we're going to use, and then we can ask those questions. Okay. Right. Does that make sense? It's as like, long as it addresses what I said on Monday. So I mean, the tell me more. Tell me well more. And they said, based on what this Last year, you know, Worcester for every hundred thousand would be thirty-eight dollars in savings, and for Middlesex would be X. That's what that's what I want. We we are gonna see well, how we're we're gonna we'll see how we we're modeled. I mean, yes. yeah, we're, we're at the whim we're at the whim of taxes. the state. Not, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and Suzanne was very clear on that. Too. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I know that there mm -hmm. are billion yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. I'm I'm looking for nodding heads also online. I don't see you, Natasha. Do Natasha that? Okay, or so that you're okay. And I, I please speak up because I'm like looking at everybody. So if I'm not seeing you, Ursula, speak up. Uh, specific educational improvements and opportunities for students, equitable opportunities. And then I put a second bullet that says sustainable, that are sustainable. Fiscally sustainable. Okay. Mm -hmm. And define equitable yeah. opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I did put that in parentheses, define, right? Yeah, just, yeah. Yep. That's awesome, thanks. Yeah, so, yeah. So can, can you read it again, Diana, just that are sustainable and fiscally responsible? I that, just, just fiscally sustainable. That are fiscally mm -hmm. sustainable. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Opportunities and cost elementary school programs, that's good. Uh, allow class sizes, good, bullet. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, maintain. I'm. I'm not reading the entire thing for the public mm -hmm. because I'm. Everybody has a copy, and you have them in front. Mm -hmm. uh, maintain or expand enrichment opportunities that are consistent across the system and fiscally responsible as well. Sustainable. And sustainable. Okay. So I'm curious about the consistent across the system. Like, why is that necessary for equitable um, expanded enrichment opportunities? Couldn't there be a scenario where we can't afford it? Every school to have every enrichment opportunity, but there's a, a flavor of them across the district. I cannot. That would be a programmatic thing that we would have to decide. I yeah. Think. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah. I think I mean, we should allow for that in the discussion instead of um, and just by taking out consistent across the system. Yeah, I think I think by the part that we are trying to get out consistent across the system is, is equitable outcomes, right, and equitable access to opportunities. Because I think there's nothing worse than when you are not allowed the opportunity. So if you're given the opportunity, so just think about society at large, right? So and when we talk about even a, you know, our, we're trying to give opportunities, especially to those kids that are furthest removed from opportunity, right? Sure. So you are in Middlesex and you have the opportunity to have I don't know band. I'm yeah. just making it up to have to have ban, but then we have another school that is not able to have ban, and you have Joe, for example, that you know ban is the dream. We should be able as a district to provide uh, equitable opportunities, and I know we need to define what that is, but I, I envision us as being able to provide those opportunities and yeah. an enrichment opportunity that it is like let's say an after school program that by any reasons is doing banjo in in Romney because you have somebody that is volunteering to do the after school program and they're doing banjo great right like that's uh, or yep. or one is doing I, I don't I don't know I'm but just your, I'm, but your I'm just example but your first example excludes the, the the opportunity of banjo at one school if you're the, to, to be consistent with what you what your first example 
if you had banjo at one school, you'd have to have banjo at all the schools. And that's not, that's, that's not. Like, what what I'm trying to say right? is just that, the, you know, if it's something, and I, and maybe the banjo is not the best example, but what I'm trying perfect. to say, like, exactly it's. exactly what I'm trying to say. No, no, because it's, it's opportunities right now. So it wouldn't be fair to have, for example, Spanish in one school and not. But like, what do we want for our kids? So that what we're saying is what we want for all our kids. Yeah, so my, my point is that it, we should we should have opportunities across the district. We yes. don't necessarily have to have exactly the same uh, programs at, at every building in, in order to have opportunities across the district. I think yeah. that's the difference between equity and and equality is that you have if you're talking about equity, then you're, you're having programs that fit the needs of each building. And, and, and if you have if you're forcing every building to have the same uh, the same programs, then then you get you get yourself into into yeah, and I and, and I'm not talking about programs necessarily, but I think they get it. <laughs> so, so with uh, actually Elizabeth had her hand up. Yeah, before I would me. Say, yeah, I was just going to say kind of to your comment and to your comment. Um, I'm thinking that there are core opportunities that all programs should have because if I live in Calais and they don't have a language, and somebody else lives in a place that has a language that wouldn't be serving all students within that core what a value or program agreed program structure what you're talking about in regards to consistency I think we've got to have something that we're going to say we are committed to providing this to any student that comes into our district regardless of where they live and so I think to your point about the after school piece you know, every every community is going to have its different culture and flavor, and so those things can come in, but we wouldn't want somebody to say, well, I can't learn a language, or I'm at a disadvantage because I live in this town versus this town. And so I think part of the work that you're talking about is that sustainability of those core right. things that we agree upon, that the administration agrees upon over a long period of time. I don't know if that helps, but that's kind of how I, I'm seeing it. So yeah. in following up on, can we get a list of what we think our core opportunity obligations are? Yeah. Because that would establish then a baseline of what we are envisioning as our core equitable opportunities that every school should have. Um, mm -hmm. And then because you do run into equity problems, if there's an abundance of volunteers in one town and they are very active, parents are very active and they're providing all these things that other towns may not have, other schools may not have. Mm -hmm. We're not addressing that, I don't think. Yeah, and I, right? and I think we let, I'm not, and I don't want to get, I, that's a budgetary question that we can that we can address too and put a parameter uh, for that. But I think right now, let's, let's, stay on the, let's stay on the criteria because the more resources we have, the more opportunities we can. <laughs> and I just want to assure yeah. that the next presentation we're doing is around baseline program. Mm -hmm. okay. That's exactly, I, that's my, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. What is what is the programming that we should assure every student, no matter what school they're in? And then we can have conversations. Hey, if we were lucky enough to have a budget that can support some additional things, then that's the decisions we can make. But we need to at least provide a core um, program. And so that's I, I, I kind of get now what you're asking. That's what we're going to present in the next session. Okay. Yeah. And those are, you know, it, they don't come out of the blue. They don't just decide, right? We just have student learning outcomes that we have already agreed yeah. as a district, right? Yeah. So yeah. we have a framework for it. Yeah, yeah we have a framework. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. yeah. So okay. Um so, Ursula, did I miss you? No. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to ask Chris if he could shift his microphone so that it's oh, more in line with in front of him because sometimes it's hard to hear him online. Oh. That, that is usually a benefit, Ursula. <laughs> I know, but if you're Fed like facing him towards himself. Floor and Steve, Stephen, your microphone needs to be more in front of you than to the side, because I'm pretty sure these are more like in-line microphones. Just okay. a request. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, so um, the, last, the last one is be, uh, be deliberate, intentional, and creative when creating shared positions across schools and very yeah. and very small FTEs. So that was an attempt to capture what we talked about. Good? Okay. You had, had a motion? You had a motion. Um, yeah. And it was second by Daniel, right? And that I had it right? Who seconded it? I will second it right now. Okay. So <laughs> moved by, by Amelia and Amelia. Oh, 
and second by Daniel. Do you got that, Nissa? Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid to ask any more discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Good work. So I have a mechanical Yes, Mr. Question. Chris. Yes. Uh, is the administration doing all this work? Well, we're doing we're a lot. Doing, yeah. yeah, I know. It, but is it all doable? So I think what we're going to find is that there are some things that are on here that we're going to come back and say we don't have data to support it. Okay. So as a criteria, it is not, I mean, you can certainly consider it, but yeah. I can't bring you data to, to know good or bad, indifferent. But there are things on here, and I think some of the questions that we heard as well um, that have come from the public are, will be incorporated within this. And in fact, we'll talk about, we have the, the new FAQ document that takes care of a little bit of what we just talked about. I also have a... Just a comment on the um, presentation from the folks uh, at uh, from Worcester, uh, and it's a plea, really, um, if they could supplement what they wrote and kind of give sources for the financial information that they were citing, because some of it I don't know where it comes from, and if they could just say we got this number from here, that I think that would be really helpful for. Us. Well, they have I'll say in defense of them, they actually do have no, some of that. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. Do. yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So Thank now you. we're gonna we're like a little behind schedule. I'm gonna try to get us sort of back on schedule because we all want to go home at a certain point tonight. So we wanna the most exciting thing right now is reviewing that data. Okay. With it with Stephen so that people in the public and it's recorded too. So Stephen. All right, so I, uh, I posted this presentation in the chat, too, so that people can have access to it. It's available on the, the website as well. This is um, the data from our uh, right thing here. Sorry, just one second. So I'm going to share my screen so that we can see this. This is the configuration study data that we talked about. I actually made some changes to this um, um, so that it answered some of your questions and also cleaned it up a little bit more. Uh, I hope you had a chance to look through it a little bit. Uh, I do want to start with an iterative timeline here. I went back and really reviewed this, and I just want to point out a couple of things on this timeline that um, I, I thought were quite interesting. Uh, there is a 2010 Doty and Rumney efficiency study that was done. Um, I have linked that uh, efficiency study. Um, there may be some people on this board who were a part of the Rumney board back then um, that would remember that, um, but it also looked at um, governance structures and some of the same things that we're talking about now. So this conversation is not brand new. Um, at the time, Rumney was reaching its maximum in terms of its student enrollment, and so um, some of the recommendations were definitely different than a declining enrollment. And so, so it was very interesting. That's available to you uh, from following that link. Um, so if you go online, you can see that. We'll put that up with the configuration uh, work that we have. Um, and then the 2014 WCSU efficiency study was also, we have that one as well. And that looked at, um, it was a precursor to Act 46 and some of the work that went on there, but it certainly looked at the governance structures across the SU at the time and made some recommendations um, at that time about how to consolidate uh, some of the services and some of the things that did come about as part of Act 46 was there as well. Um, and then from there, I've jumped into more present day. Um, so you can see that our, our timeline around strategic planning, uh, approaches to configuration, the October 2023 data, which is some of what we've reviewed again um, in this August 24, but um, we're just, we've got some new people and some people are just coming to the discussion. So we just wanna make sure that everybody has this. I will, I will uh, fully own the fact that this presentation does not get as deep as some of the work that is being asked for. Um, this gives us a much, uh, a, as clear a view as the, of the district, its staffing and its student population as we can, so that we can then talk about the programming in the next meeting, so that we can then talk about the financials in the third meeting. Those all three kind of go in that order so that we can make sure that we, um, we talk about our programmings before we talk about how much we're gonna spend on them. Um, so, and this is just, who are we doing that for? This criteria was the original that we started with that's on there, but we certainly just approved a much uh, broader and deeper criteria, which is helpful. And I would just appreciate where we've come in terms of that work. 
And so um, I shared this with the, um, the configuration committee. There is, um, this is a broad summary of mm -hmm. optimal class size research. Um, it generally says that class sizes pre-K through three should be 13 to 18 students. Vermont EQS says less than 20. Fourth through sixth grade is 18 to 25 students and the EQS says less than 25. And seven through 12th is 20 to 30 students um, for optimal class sizes. Um, and then the research, I, these are definitions. This doesn't speak to efficacy or anything like that, but the, just the definitions that are used in research, primarily for elementary schools as small schools is 100 to 300 students, middle is 200 to 600, high school is 400 to 900, and very small, the definition of very small is given usually to schools with less than 200 kids. Um, and so when we look at those numbers, um, several of our elementary schools are hovering around 100. Uh, our middle school is right now as configured as just a couple of hundred students, and our high school is just slightly over 400. So we're at the bottom end of small school um, for all of our configuration as it is right now. Stephen, can I ask a quick question? Sure. The optimal class size research, the column on the left, like the 13 to 18, yes. where does that come from versus so, the Vermont equipment? So that comes from a wide variety of research. Okay. So, um, so I got a synthesis of uh, several studies. I can pu I can publish the the links to those cri uh, citations for us so that we can have those. But um, I was not trying to. There, there's a lot of pros and cons to th that class size piece, sure. but that tended to be the optimal class size according to research. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. But and I'll put the citations up for that. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is our total enrollment for the district. Um, it's the historical and then through the physical year 25 is the year that we are currently about to start. And so you see that we are at, as of today, we have 1,379 kids enrolled in our schools. Um, and you can see that we will in next year, the projections is for 1,320. Um, the projections, they get fuzzier and fuzzier as you go out, but um, we are going to somewhere in the upper 1200s is where it seems to level out um but it could get it, actually I, I, let me revise that it's probably gonna get closer to 1200 and you'll see why in just a second when we when we look at this um there was a question about enrollment by grade level um that came up in our committee so i just wanted you to see historically here's physical year 23 for the elementary schools i combine the pre-k three and four year olds so that's two groups of kids that are in that first column, um, but gives you an idea of how many students we have at each grade level um, in 23, then in 24. Um, and then I just want to just get to where we are right now, our current year. And I would just, um, I would just point out the size of our classes. Um, traditionally, we're up in the upper 90s um, to around 100 um, over the past years. And now we're getting down to where the average class sizes are down into the 80s um, with, and I would point out, second grade is 66 students um, this year. This is the enrollment as of today. Um, we only have 66 kids in our second grade across the entire district. Yeah. And so, so we can see those numbers. Now, I did... I did a little projection into physical year 26, but you're, you're making some guesses around kindergarten because you don't all of your pre K aren't necessarily um, all of your kindergartners. You're going to typically have some more. Um, so that number mo most likely will go up some um, that student of 69 students. But our first grade, this is a question mark as well. If we do not gain a lot of kids into the first grade from kindergarten, which there are some that we get sometimes, um, that's a smaller class too. And so, so just kind of pointing out that we're moving into the 80s with some 60s for total classes. And you can see throughout there that ranges from the low of five kids in the first grade at Romney because there were five kindergartners this year, um, you know, to a high of what are we, a 30 in Berlin in the fourth grade. Questions? All right. Yeah. I get, I get, Go ahead. Um, what I asked the community meeting was about the fluctuations, so like the variance as we go. Mm -hmm. And so this does a good job of showing there are there are some 60s. I think a great example is just look at Berlin's third yeah. grade. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a, a 27 and a 30 size class on each side of a 13. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there, there are some fluctuations that occurs through 
that has occurred throughout time. Um, and uh, and I would also point out, and and this is none of these are value statements. This just if you are doing a multi-grade classroom, and Doty, I'm just going to use Doty because that's their model right now. If you have first and second grade together, you have 18 students. And if you have, and then if those kids, when they move up, right, they're going to join the class above them, right? So there would be nine with 11 kids, you know, in the next grade level up. So if you think of a cohort of students, the total student population in a multi-grade classroom would be looking at both classes on either side of the class. So if I were saying the fourth grade, um, their entire cohort and their time at Doty will include the third grade and the fifth grade at some point in time. And so their entire cohort would be, you know, uh, what is it, uh, 29 kids would be their entire cohort that they would have in classes together. And so that just gives you a little idea of like how big, how many kids are they exposed to within a cohort in that model and kind of gives you an idea of that. All right. Moving on to U32, um, this is the enrollment over um, from physical year 23 and projected out to physical year 28 because it's easier to project because we've got the kids in the system already. Um, and so you can see physical year 25. Um, I put in a column there that's called out of district. These are students who come to us from sending districts um, from the uh, exchange program we do. Uh, with Montpelier or with um, uh, the lottery, yeah, right? So yeah. yeah, so uh, the vast majority of our kids are coming from Orange, Washington. Um, that mm -hmm. fall into that. I'll show you a little breakdown of physical year twenty-five, so you can see a little more clearly what that out of district looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, and then those projections uh, 26, 27, 28, just move the grade levels up without adding students necessarily. Um, except I would just point out in the out of district, we are seeing a pretty significant decline in the number of students. Um, we lose 22 out of district students. They graduate, would not lose them. They graduate um, and between 26 and 27. Um, and the number of kids who've been coming in uh, hovers around nine. And so I use that as the entrance number, but the exit number there was high, 22 kids, pretty big number. Is, that is it typical that a student that's tuitions in comes in at seventh grade or and no, then, and then stays they, they come the tuition students come in at ninth, ninth grade. grade. We have um, and you'll see in the next slide. So I gave a closer look at uh, physical year 25 and I think this helps you really see um, how many students do we actually have in the building versus how many students do we have. And so um, the in district students. Those are all of our students from our sending towns. The out of district, you see we only have one student from out of district in the eighth grade. Um, that's not normal, but that can happen. Because um, out of district can be tuition students, uh, choice students, lottery doesn't start until high school. And then exchange could be, we have done exchange with Montpelier for middle school on occasion. If we have a middle schooler that wants from here that wants to go there and from there that wants to come here. There's no there's no money exchanged in that situation. It's only a kid exchange. So is it normal to have this low a number for seventh and eighth grade from from out of district? Yeah, you don't. That's the normal that's right the normal. there. Okay. Yeah, that's what you would expect to see. And then it jumps up in ninth grade. And ninth grade is where we start to see the kids okay. enter. Yep. And so um, so you can see this year we have nine students um, from out of district in the ninth grade, 12, 10th, 22, as I was mentioning, in the 11th grade and nine in the 12th grade that are out of district. It also shows you that we have 64 students who attend the tech center, mm -hmm. right? So the students tuition into the tech center. We have 29 students who are doing early college in the 12th grade. Um, and, um, and then those other placements are students who are placed in a variety of settings um, as needs uh, dictate. Stephen, if everyone could go to the tech center that wanted to go to the tech center, how big would that number be? Uh, <laughs> gosh, it's going to be more than that. Yes. Um, I don't know that it's a, a tremendous number more than that. Uh, we, we had a, a record number of kids accepted into the tech center this last year. Oh, and so, yeah, good for good for our kids. There's great programming. Um, so yeah. that's there. I think first Where's last that? Go ahead. Stephen, I was curious. So like in the 10th grade, it shows 
a fewer number of students at the tech center? Is that because of the tech center's capacity? And does that number increase as that cohort moves forward in time potentially? No, no, the 10th grade program is a pre-tech program that they go to there. So there's a limited number of students uh, um, that can attend the tech center as a ninth or 10th grader. Typically it's just 10th graders that are accepted into the pre-tech program. And then they start the full um, program in the 11th grade um, where they specialize more um, in Thank one Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, oh, sorry, can no? you also just describe early college and other placements? I feel like I should know this, but if I don't, okay. maybe people in the public don't. So, okay, so early, early college is um, students who opt to go to college in their senior year. Um, so the students are attending Norwich, VTC, um, CCV has some programming as well. The, a big number of our students go to Norwich. Um, that's where the largest number go to. And they essentially complete a year of college. Um, some of it, uh, some of it is necessary for graduation. So some of them are typically taking an English class, a math class, a social studies um, that counts back towards their high school graduation requirements, and um, and they are able to gain college credit um, before so they graduate. They're not counted in our building, or they are. They are not in the building. Okay. So when you see so students full time in building, that gotcha. sixty one kids in the senior class, half of your seniors are not attending like school them. in the building. How do the finances work for the college? So it's a little complicated, <laughs> but um, but they are the our our education tax funds are directed to the college for those kids to go there. There is a cap on some of that, so we don't end up once we get to a certain number of kids, it doesn't. It's not as big a penalty, but we do lose some revenue as a result of kids who go to early college. Okay, do we know how much per student? Um, I can be the cap. I, I, I can find out how much that okay. is. I don't have that at the top of my head. Yeah. And if you think about the Ed Fund as a, uh, as a whole, right, it's a pretty large expense for a few kids, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're trying to think about the sustainability of the Ed Fund. It's, it's yeah. huge. Yeah, so, so from the political standpoint, the Ed Fund supports more than just your local public school. It also supports kids doing early college and things like that mm -hmm. as well. Is this number fairly average? Uh, that's a little bit higher um, than what we typically have, but um, but it is um, we we typically have twenty kids that that go to early college. Um, other placements are a variety of placements based on uh, student need, uh, okay. and to say much more would be to kind of out what those student needs are. Thank yeah. You. yeah, yeah. So that gives you uh, a we have six. Hundred and well, we have 700 kids essentially on the books for U32, and there are 582 kids in the building. Um, now, I would also just say that some of the tech center kids come back here and take a class. Um, uh, some of, so they're they'll take, the building. huh? They're not all in the building though. No, they're not. But yeah, some okay. of them come back and take class. Uh, oh, still okay. need to take some classes with us. Um, usually, it's uh, financial. Uh, literacy, um, a social studies class, those kinds of things. Um, and our early college kids and our tech center kids still make use of our school counseling services and other services within the school. And um, they are, are allowed to participate in all co-curricular activities as well. So, so they still make use of some of the school activities. We don't always get money for those <laughs> students, just an FYI. All right, so that gives you a kind of a, a much deeper look at that. Um, and then we talked about the elementary classroom configuration. This is this year. We have 34 classrooms that um, K6. I did not include the pre-K in this. Uh, it's because they use uh, uh, their half day. So it, which I think can answer when we say 10 classrooms of students at uh, Rumney in the reconfiguration. It's uh, one of those classrooms is a morning and afternoon. I did hear the questions about CC and all that. We'll talk about programming at the next one. Uh, but this is the configuration. This is not the configuration that we had last year. Um, it did not look like this. It was a different variety of this same setup. Um, and so that's this. I put in here what the proposal would look like for three schools. Um, it would look like 29 classrooms, K6, uh, K five, pardon me, um, with if the sixth grade were going to U32. And so this just gives you a different breakdown of what it would look like in fiscal year 26 if we were to go and 
have straight classrooms, um, straight grade level classrooms. There's a lot more modeling around programming that will bring this back um, for you to look at. Um, provided the current demographics, this comes from our uh, annual report. So this shows you um, how many of our students qualify for special education services and qualify for free and reduced lunch. So this is our measures of students with need. And I cleaned up the staffing so that this is FTE, not just number of people. This helps us look a lot more detailed into it. And I appreciate the questions and the, and the feedback from several people on that so that you can see that, um, I think we reported like 320 something mm -hmm. total bodies, but it's actually 307.21 FTEs once you do all of the math on part-time and um, others. So you can see the actual. Was there a FTEs. reason why you didn't split out non-instructional? I, I I was having trouble getting just getting it all together. Um, <laughs> my pivot table worked really well for this, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's not. Uh, you you can kind of count count on the fact that um, every one of the elementary schools has um, uh, one to one to two custodians. Uh, one to two food service workers, and those are typically your other ESPs okay. in there, right? So, um, like Dodie has one food service worker, um, and and so that just that's one of those ESPs down at the bottom. Any other questions on this? All right. And then um, I just left in the tax information. This is how much we paid for taxes this last year, residents, non-residents, and then what came from the general education fund for our district. Um, I know that the total there does not add up to what we had as a total expenditure, but that's because of revenues and other things. And then we had um, just the homestead demographics, we kept that in there as well, just to show people how taxes were paid by our communities. So income based in the top two, combination in the third row, and then um, full homestead tax rate in the bottom row. So it just gives you a little bit of idea. Um, tried to look up some rental questions. That's not as easy as it, it, it is, as you'd think. Yeah, I'm working on it too. Yeah, so um, so one of the questions that come up is what's the demographics around rentals and all of that that I, I did a little digging as well and that was not an easy number to find quickly. I'm going to try to speak to some of our realtors and see, <laughs> see if they have some better numbers. And let Daniel find it. Um, <laughs> all right, and then, volunteer. Yeah, and then um, and then I would just say here's our um, here's our historical budget increases so that we have that and we can see what was done. So and, and this speaks to the sustainability. At what level do we think that we can sustain um, change in our budgets over time? Um, and we can see that uh, in the last two years have definitely been some of the larger increases attributable to a variety of factors, um, you know, from healthcare costs, um, a negotiated agreement. Um, and I, I thought about another one that affected that was that the excess spending threshold was removed mm -hmm. and, and it's coming back, but it was removed then. And then, because I was just like trying to think about other things besides our, the decisions that we took then. Right. That that has played a role. Yeah, on, definitely. On, on, on that. Yeah. So, I hope that clarified some of the questions that you'd had. I hope that this just gives you a good kind of broad based look at okay, this is this is where the kids are, and next the next time we come together, we'll talk about what we're doing with them once they get here, um, so that we can talk about the programming, the co curriculars, extracurriculars, all of those kinds of things that we might be doing with kids. And how we are, uh, and how we organize those kind of programs. So I am going to stop my share. Okay. So I I'm going to give us a little bit of a break, but I think we can do the last three things really quickly, and then we will take a little break before moving the reports to the board. Does that seem reasonable to everybody? So the next is uh, affirming our work plan. It was included in the packet 
there's a couple of things that even this morning we noticed with Stephen that need to be changed, but it's basically just an affirmation of our work plan. If you guys had any revisions, just feel free to tell us right now or email us. I even made one revision this morning uh, that we had missed, uh, and then there Russia. Uh, yes, Ursula. I had questions because it looked like our local presentations and board learning was around SEL, which is what we did last year, and I was curious. <laughs> Yes. Is that one of the changes? Okay, awesome. Yeah, um, we, we knew you were going to get us on this. I know, Ursula. yeah, that's what I um, Know that Ursula is going to. No, we we are going to. Um, w the leadership team is going to decide what uh, common presentations we would like to do, so that you can get a good cross section of how it's done across the district. Excellent. Um, and then I noticed a couple of the Ed Quality Committee presentations to the board weren't listed, but I can shoot you an email with those dates. Thank you. I, I just remembered this is a living document and we're putting it together as we go, but we're going to make sure yeah. the policy committee also, we need to make sure that yeah. we get that lined up. And I think there's a few little tweaks to the budget process as well. And then the other thing was the, you know, we need to update the possible times for a community forum and for learning. We had it on September 4th, but that's also a date that could be a community forum. And then the last day, Last thing was the October second meeting, Stephen. Mm. Um, yes, we have a. Um, we had an oversight. Rosh Hashanah starts at sundown on October second, mm -hmm. and so um, so I, I would I would request to the board that you consider moving that to the Tuesday because Rosh Hashanah actually runs um, several, you know, a couple of nights, and so. Um, that's an important meeting for us if we are if we are doing a vote uh, that needs to be warned um, for a ballot that's going to be about our last chance to do that before the November ballot and so so, so we would be moving it to October 1st first yeah does that work for everybody you know that obviously there would be a remote option too but would that work instead of Sending a doodle poll if you yeah. just yeah. tell you yes. right now. Yes. 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 Okay. It's a Zoom option. Okay. And there, that would be, yeah, there, there would be. There a, will always be a remote option. Yeah. Yeah. According to the new meeting right. laws. Right. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm moving it in the work plan. So if you walk into the work plan, no walk. Link, link it. Was, was there also, I remember us discussing as part of the local presentation, could it be connected to the strategic plan? And so I didn't know if leadership team was considering. Yeah, I just have not been able to get to that. No, and that's fine, but I just wondered if you were remembering that. that it's question. one of my notes. Okay. Okay. And, and the, yeah, go ahead. Kim. The, the other thing that we had talked about, just so that it's really clear, like configuration study is here. If we have the next two studies written yeah, yeah, in we'll those, just so that people don't <laughs> read this and freak out that we're not, yeah. Yeah, bring mm -hmm. in. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, and that is, I don't, I don't need, uh, I don't need a motion for that. I just really want to everybody to affirm we're good with that. Okay. And then uh, affirm our superintendent evaluation uh, evaluation process. I send you the link to the tool. We continue to. We have a couple of new board members, Elizabeth and Patrick. We, we have a, a tool that we've been using uh, for the past uh, almost. 60, I'm looking at, at Jen because we started experimenting with her. So it's four, four years. years. This will be the fourth. Fourth, fourth. Mm -hmm. yeah, four years. And I, we got the tool for Vermont Schools Association. We hired them for two, two twice, and now we've been using the tool ourselves for the last a few years. So hired them just once. And so it's just sharing that. In that, in the timeline, it says that, you know, Stephen would be presenting his second draft of goals, but actually he was going to be presenting his first draft in September because he didn't have it similar to what we did with Jen right he didn't start it usually the superintendent sets his goals in May in June for the following year. And so he's Remember, just going to be I've presenting. only been on the job for six weeks now yes. so just so. FYI. <laughs> So and and then we finish uh, the summary of the evaluation will be done uh, by in in March, and the evaluation the steering committee is responsible for the evaluation of our superintendent. Well, this whole board is responsible for evaluation. The steering committee is responsible for spearheaded, being responsible for it to take place. 
So it's just affirming that process. We're still all on the same page on that. Thumbs up. Good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, board learning and onboarding. Uh, we were thinking of doing this. Uh, I'm going to go back to the work plan. I have too many documents <laughs> open. Uh, we were thinking of possibly doing the onboarding on the September 4th uh, meeting. We have a lot on that meeting. We have Ed Quality. I haven't forgotten you, Ursula. We have we have Ed Quality, and we would also have the new presentation of data. But because we're breaking a little bit, we would just do a little onboarding on that of that meeting, and then the next part of the onboarding would be on the board, uh, the board budget training. We would do the that part from there. We already did some open meeting law at our retreat, so we would try to make it simple so that we make sure that we're learning. Uh, the time does that make sense and then uh, if you could uh, well i'll do that as for Moscow association but we will talk about potentially all attending the conference for example to get all right so that's that am i forgetting anything in there in the no, the no okay so we fear it'd be better than sending a doodle poll out and just it, do small it snippets yeah. too small yeah. snippet because yeah it was hard to get a date. <laughs> in this bit proxy, you all have the information there. So we usually have a motion. I'm looking through the screen to you, Ursula, to nominate our superintendent to be able to authorize him to be the person in charge of signing our, attending the meeting and having the authority for Washington Central. And and this bit is then for those that don't know, we actually are not insured through VISB. VISB is one of the few districts that are not, but we still participate because uh, it's, they provide insurance for most of our school uh, districts. We have done the pros and cons, and we went through this last year, so I'm not going to bore you with that because I don't even have a document in front of me right now. But, uh, but it is uh, it, it's, it's a great organization that supports education across the state, and we participate on the on the meetings and they also do serve uh, some for our custodial staff there's some professional development that is done through them uh, so anything else that yeah. i forgot on that no no no. this bit provides us with a great deal of uh, training, training particularly around legal matters so with that could i have a motion ursula has her hand up ursula i move that we appoint stephen dellinger pate to be our representative for the visbit meeting Thank you, Ursula. A second. Second. Thank you, Patrick. We have a motion on the table. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, hearing none, the motion carries. So let's go ahead and uh, and I take a quick break okay. and you know, be back uh, at seven. At eight, sorry, at eight, wishful thinking. Okay. And just a reminder that these might. All right. Okay, let's get started. Uh, reports to the board. So, Stephen, our superintendent, is going to highlight some things for us from the packet. Yeah. Um, so you saw the, the report. Um, I put a letter in there that tried to outline the work that we're doing, so that uh, that the, you and the community could see where we're trying to go with all of all of this work. I um, definitely want to highlight that um, our September fourth is the programmatic. Our September eighteenth is the fiscal, and so we're just and. I know that we said that we would have stuff at the end of August in terms of finances, but we really do need to have a programmatic conversation so that we make sure that we represent that properly in the financial um, so that we can have that um, as, as accurate as we can. And I just want to remind everyone that we control our expenses. We don't control tax rates. I mean, like that's just we, we just don't. Um, uh, you can read through uh, the reports. Um, I want to highlight around vacancies. That's our big piece um, there. I sent you a correspondence that we sent out to our uh, Doty, Rumney, and Callis families because uh, we have the, a shortage of one school nurse within the district. And so we are going to have to, in the meantime, 
uh, split services across those communities. So we'll have uh, three days of nursing services at uh, Callis, three days at Doty, and four days at Rumney. And the days when someone is not, a nurse is not in the building, we're gonna be working on a telehealth option. I might need to talk to one of my board members about some ways that that works, because um, he has more experience than us. But we're gonna definitely make sure that they have access to a, a nurse through tele, uh, telehealth in some way. Uh, during that time, we continue to advertise for a school nurse um, so that we can fill that position. It's a position that's in our budget, um, but I just wanted to make sure that I highlighted that. We also, as a leadership team met, we're short um, library media specialists uh, for, uh, for several of our schools. Um, we still need a special education teacher that's split between Callis and Berlin, and we still need some physical education and health support. We came up with several options that we're exploring. So I've got uh, the teams really, they're contacting everybody and anybody they know that might be able to help us out during this time. We have contingency plans to make sure that we can uh, cover all of those. Um, and we'll keep reporting to you as we hopefully, hopefully you'll see that we're bringing you a couple of new hires or expanded some, uh, some other uh, positions to be able to uh, meet those needs. There's also a few support staffs. We would encourage anybody that is in our community um, that might be interested in helping out in the schools. We could certainly use, um, if you're not certified, there's still jobs in our school system that you can uh, be a part of. Food service um, is one area and paraeducators are another. And we would be happy to welcome people into those roles. Thank you, Stephen. Are there any other questions from the report? That I just have one question about substitutes. Do we have like a more, I see that we are still looking for substitutes. Always. Is Always. it a more robust list than it's no. been in? No, it's not. No, um, we, yes, if you would like to substitute. So you can only work one day a week for the school system. We would be happy for you to come join us as a substitute teacher. Um, all grade levels, we've got openings. And so we'd be happy and, to and have I, you. Yeah. As board members, you would need a waiver. They uh, Through the pandemic, we had waivers, but as board members, you would need a waiver to be able to. So ask your friends and get it you know or family that is retired or kids that are here i've been trying to tell like it's, it's great for them and by kids i mean you know 19 to or 18 year olds that are that are that are home in a, you know or are in a gap year I, I don't know we're happy to put anybody to anybody work anybody to work um i'm not saying so, you can't do it but we would need a waiver it's not best yeah. practice so but you can you can volunteer but you can't get paid Okay. <laughs> we'll definitely take, take volunteers, board members as substitute teachers. <laughs> Just, I'm going, I want to be on record as saying that. <laughs> okay, then um, we. Sorry, oh, quick sorry. question about the nursing. Um, yes. On the days where an individual school doesn't have a nurse, will there be a substitute in that position, or will the other staff members be expected to? I heard the telehealth question. Yes. But like, telehealth can't distribute meds to kids. Um, so who is so there is a designated person who will be able to distribute any medication in each of the buildings when there's not a nurse, um, and uh, and we will we have a hard time getting nurse substitutes as well. So uh, so we're not looking to substitute into that position at this point in time, and we we understand that there might not be a nurse in every building on every day. I guess I just worry about the smaller schools where there's you know at Doty fifteen point eight seven FTE. If someone is needing to fill that role two days a week, that's you know going to draw from something else fairly significant, I would imagine, mm -hmm. and, and, and stress the staff there. And and I think the, to help answer that question, when we talk about programmatic, we're going to talk about um, nurse visits and things like that, so you can get a good picture of what is the demand upon our, our nurses um, within our programs. And we are still trying to hire a nurse. We are absolutely still trying to hire all of these positions. Yes, we're we're advertising and looking at all options. So, if you have any friends, particularly those with a, an RM. Yeah, I just have a quick question. I know at Callis, um, there was a like a, a general behaviorist role um, mm -hmm. that kind of led the student support group for behaviors and things like that. Mm -hmm. Where would that position fall under in this? Oh, when we're looking at the chart. Yeah, like um, in the position. So staff. that would be probably under the teacher. Yeah, they're certified teachers it's a teacher. okay. in most of those roles. Thank you. Thank you. Just to note that someone's trying to join oh. the meeting. Oh, sorry. Uh, Julie. Hi, Julie. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions about from the report? 
No? Okay. So then uh, we're, uh, we're, we're going to move into the uh, Central Vermont Career Center. Uh, uh, Patrick is going to join the, the, the board. He hasn't been to a meeting uh, yet because the board has been in recess. Mm -hmm. But he will join the next board. I, I can uh, give a quick, uh, as you know, the Career Center is completely really dear to my heart. So I've been trying to separate with a really hard way. But so I'm in their finance committee. But when I, you guys get the newsletter too. But when I got the newsletter, I was incredibly excited and proud to see, it's just not, it's a dear friend too, but Ellie Farr, who was a student at U32 and went to, uh, I've been to New York City for, for school. I'm trying to think, uh, to the new school, Just actually, the new to, the, to the new school. Um, and she is now joining the staff as a lab assistant for the digital and media arts. She's an amazing artist. She actually did the piece for the student on that year for the Graham Award, the, the Hagen Award, I always yes. say it wrong. So, so you know and then if you want a, a great way to follow the central vermont career center is to follow their instagram if you guys have instagram all of their programs baking and culinary is super funny you know cosmo on instagram is also really really funny and they have you know medical profession and instagram too and it's but they're all on instagram so whatever you're you know so medical might be good for you michael and then you know exploratory <laughs> It's a great way to support the kids uh, uh, too, and they're they're really great. The baking and culinary, especially, are very active. Okay, and then in the VSBA uh, update, uh, because of time today, I don't want to go over the entire. Uh, we're going to use that memo for for budgeting. Mm -hmm. It would be a really. It's a memo that I just don't want to just like, kind of look at it without <laughs> putting some uh, some some time on it. But uh, please take a look at the memo. We'll use it uh, during our budgeting season. Uh, what I did want to say is that if you guys could start to uh, think about your October uh, schedule, the, um, I'm going to just open it here. The conference for uh, Vermont uh, School Boards Association is uh, October 24th. Uh, it's on a Friday. We're going to do it on a, on a uh, Thursday and a Friday. The Thursday, the, the Thursday evening, that we got a lot of uh, input that it was really hard for people to take two days, two days off. So the Thursday evening is really a celebration of public uh, schools in in Vermont. So there would be student expositions. It would be a great way for you guys to see what is going on around the state. And then on Friday, the whole day on Friday would be. Uh, learning and especially it's, it's called together stores tomorrow and the, the role really is to focus on the essential essential work of school boards and especially putting a focus on uh, on the um, uh, governance the, the school district governance which we are going to be uh, looking at so uh, let me see we're trying to all this. So the district quality and standards, which are designed to ensure that all students receive uh, substantially equal access to quality education. So the AOE is going to be conducted into mirror reviews, and we will be part uh, of that. So uh, what we're going to do is have some uh, uh, continuing learning there to assist boards in adapting these new rules. And so we, they have developed, we have developed some self-evaluation ways to see like, here's where we are in this standard, you know, whatever standard in governance is, and, and there, see if there's any gaps. Uh, the way that we, you know, our work plan and having a vision and a mission, like we very much operate already towards those standards, but we would be able to see where we have gaps and where we can, where we can improve. Um, and then the other part that will be uh, taking part of that is that, um, budgeting so any new uh, as you know the commission of the future of public education has just started its work and any new things that start to come it's something that it would be great for you guys also to pay attention of those conversations on the state uh, statewide and um, any any questions and just make sure that you are you are on the list of uh, you should be receiving every tuesday uh, our emails and open them up even if you don't read them all uh, if you open them, we can, you know, we can at least know that we're reaching, <laughs> uh, re reaching you, um, and you know, we 
we have goals towards that and we've been trying to improve that so if there's something in the newsletter that is not working we added national stuff now if there's something that would be helpful and and then for our new board members and julia if you're still uh, with us uh, please sign up for you know for for the webinars or the new there's a onboarding start it started already but you can join and do the last <coughs> the one that they already did you can look at the webinar online okay can I say we forgot one thing oh. um we you saw a handout the uh, faq document oh, oh, has oh, been updated oh, and yes. so i'm gonna put a link in the chat for those that are out there so there's an updated faq that's answered some of these questions you had a hard copy there it's also up on our configuration website and um, it's available as part of the board packet as well yeah and i sent you guys all a link today when we put it live on there and again it's a living document there's some what we did is we cleaned up the document and, and sat helped me with this document uh, before and what we did right now is that we're trying to have just one person uh, write it and ben is it's known our district for a while and so that we are able to uh, answer those questions in, in a way that it's, mm -hmm. he's exposed to all of our, our, our emails and our strategic planning. And, and we're going to start attaching some of the data, any of the data that goes with any of the questions, we'll start making sure that those are attached as well. Exactly. Yeah. So that's the part that is missed. So it's going to be missing there. So that's the part that is missing there. And the other part is we took out the question of what criteria because we didn't have the criteria yet. So all of that will be updated for our next board meeting. And I'm pointing out one more thing. The the very first part of that oh, document yes, yes, has the yes, definition of equity, equity that is used by the Vermont AOE, um, and it has a link to the document that yeah. uh, that they use uh, yeah. for their equity statement. So yeah. that gives yeah. you uh, at least here's a definition that is used um, generally throughout the state. Yeah, and we and and we and we're going to add a link we just didn't get there to our equity policy too because also has a definition that is very similar to what is what is that uh, no great yeah totally about that. yeah okay so now we can move into finance and i think we can get out of here on time can i ask a quick question yes. as a follow-up to the retreat so the communication um document that we were talking about that would have links and things like that do we have just a timeline as to when that will be? So we have the first one. That's another thing that I forgot. We have the first one today, which is the correspondence. And then the other one, to be honest with you, I just emailed it to Melissa today. So she was not able to turn it around no, as yeah, quickly as, as, as we wanted. But we are using it to take notes today so that it's part of the document. What I did do is uh, start the, we have a correspondence uh, document now, and I'll just share it with you guys. And I'll <coughs> update you on our work at the next board meeting. Okay, I'll bring yeah. that. So we, we now have a board correspondence a document that has just been, uh, mm -hmm. or has been updated to, this is too little here, but I'll send you the link. Yeah, That's the yeah. only link that I didn't put in the thing before. So it's, it's the name. So right now we have, we can go over. I was going to do that at the end of the meeting, but I'm happy to do it right now. So it's, uh, we have name, date, link, and response. So we had the letter from uh, uh, Melissa uh, Purchase that mm -hmm. you guys also the, re the response. We had the letter from the Worcester community. Uh, to that one, we haven't, we responded. We just haven't mm -hmm. attached the response there. It, their configuration calculations those two letters are posted there and the public comment from also Worcester is posted there those are the only i'm not yeah. planning to go right. backwards right. No. all the way it just like we had this meeting and then we'll not add but we would have another table for the next meeting right mm -hmm. what correspondence do we get between now and then mm -hmm. would be attached in that document yeah thank you I okay. think the audio is off as well. It's oh, no. to join audio. No, that one usually is. Oh, we yeah. are. Ooh, look at that face. What is that? But we're frozen. Mine is okay. Oh, we're frozen just there. Can yeah, you hear us okay, Suzanne? Yeah. Have you been able to listen? Oh, my God. Yes. Okay. So, okay, so it's, just the, it's just that because we were, at, yeah. Okay. I figured Ursula would have. Okay. So we're, we're still fine. We're still fine. Okay. So mm -hmm. then let's move back 
to the finance committee. Ready for some motions? Yes, Daniel. And Suzanne's here with us online if we have any questions. So the first one is approved district wide exterior door reeking project, and I'm looking for a motion. I move that the board approve the use of the capital improvement fund reserves to pay for a district wide exterior door reeking project for an amount not to exceed $35,000. Thank you, Daniel. A second. 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 Okay. Thank you. Any questions? All right. That's pretty straightforward. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay, so we have 5.1, 5.2. Uh, approved contingency increase for the safety system of the Vermont contract. It's on page 22, and I'm again looking for a motion. I move the board approve increasing the allowed contingency for the safety systems of Vermont contract by $39,140 for a total contract amount not to exceed $469,671. Thank you, Hillary and Daniel. Uh, any, any discussion? The, the recommendation of the Finance Committee was to approve it, just in case that's how they go. Any questions on it? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. Great. 5.3, award the bid for U32 replacement of mower. I move the board. Go? Okay, SAC. I move, I move here to be authorized the superintendent purchase of 2024 event track Kubota tractor 4520Y with wide area mower and accessories from grassland from amount not to, not to exceed $41,855.76. Great, thank you. Uh, second? second. Uh, thank second. you, Kim. Yeah. All right, uh, any questions or any discussion? All right. Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Five point four <laughs> review and discuss the draft the budget timeline. So we talked a little bit about this at the at our retreat, right? And we made some of the I believe we made some of the changes. I'm just going back to have too many documents open. Yes. I would just point out that we've moved up dates for the process by a month from last year, which were moved up a month from the year before. And so just to, as a reminder, when you move it earlier too, there's a few more estimates involved, um, but uh, we are certainly uh, confident that we can, we can follow this timeline. Susan, do you have anything that you would like to add? That I don't no. think so. Um, there were some suggestions of uh, changes to wording at the finance committee meeting, which have not been made to this document yet, but it was a little bit of tweaking that we'll do. And then the leadership team meetings haven't been uh, solidified yet. So that's why those dates aren't in there yet. Um, but no, not really. Okay. Thank you, Suzanne. Floor? Yes. I was just wondering if it was possible to um, keep all of last year's budget resources online clearly defined in a, maybe a folder for last year's budget resources sure. just for reference sake and then sure. as we, yeah. because i think there was some lack of clarity between what had been uploaded for last year versus what was still up from the year prior um, uh, yeah the confusion so was there revolting it's nice to have them and okay. also it's important that they be clearly I do think there's some uh, work that needs to be done on the budget page on the website. Danielle, you're right. Yeah, yeah. So we'll uh, we'll ask Melissa to look at to look at that mm -hmm. and maybe add a put a folder that is separate. Yeah. So like it's like a folder shape that says budget resources from last year, mm -hmm. and then have the links for this year be <laughs> separate be so that people can get to it. Okay, sounds great. Thank you for that. Um, 
So now, so it's really just reviewing. I don't need a motion for that. We are, as a board, committing to this budgeting timeline. <clears throat> uh, substitute rate and pay. That was just uh, FYI for the board. Um, there's no approval needed on that, um, but just uh, making sure that you knew what we were doing. Okay, so you want to recommend people? Or? <laughs> Yeah, and if you have anybody that you know that could substitute, uh, we'd be happy to take their names. Uh, not that this is going to be a recurring theme, but we're, we're happy to entertain. Okay. How do we employ students? What are, what's, in what so, capacity? So every now and then we have students do uh, summer work for us, um, or custodial grounds um, is typically what we have. Um, it's not often, but every now and then we have a kiddo who helps us out, particularly moving all the furniture around in the summer. Um, when we're uh, cleaning floors, hire a couple of strong backs for that. <laughs> okay. Hope so. Work is company means. <laughs> okay. I'm going to attempt to keep us on schedule and get us out of here early. Floor. So. Yes. Floor. Before you jump out of finance, I just wanted to clarify really quick Bizbit, we are a member of the unemployment. Uh, oh, that's true. That's true. So, so that is why we do sure. the proxy. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I just wanted to be real clear on that. Yeah, that's, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So see. And you should have jumped right away. Sorry about that. But yeah. yeah, that's how we get the training. Sorry, I forgot to clarify. I just assumed everybody. Sorry. Okay. So now let's move into personnel. So approve new teachers in page 41. Motion. I move that the board high, uh, approve new hires for the 24-25 school year. Will Keller, middle school English at U32. Sarah Ainsworth, the RISE coordinator at U32. Jared Weiss, the principal at Callis Elementary. Jacqueline Hunt, the music teacher at Rumney and EMES. And Catherine Nicali Flippin as an interventionist for Doty. Thank you, Daniel. Sorry. Second by Zach. Any questions? Any discussion? Um, why aren't the salaries listed? What? They used to. They used to in the past. So I asked that that form be modified so that we see what the salaries are. Okay. Um, and have contracts been signed for all these folks yet? Yes. So, are we approving what's already been done? Is it, we are, is, is, what? Is, I'm is, just asking is, questions. Yes. Ceremonial. Okay. yes, 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 okay. absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, resignations. Oh, wait, you don't oh, actually need a vote. Oh, oh, sorry, yeah. All those please. in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. All right. Resignation. Could I have a motion? I move we approve the resignation of Amanda Morse, special educator at Berlin. Thank you. Zach. Second. Second by Daniel. Got it, Lisa. All those in favor, please. Wait, I have a question. Oh, Is there an explanation as to why she's requesting a resignation? So she uh, requested to be released from her contract that she had signed. Um, I had granted that because it was a position that allowed her to advance, um, and we typically honor somebody advancing in the profession. So she's able to acquire a position that allowed her some new opportunities and some growth that we weren't able to afford her here. So. All those in favor, oh, go ahead. Do, did we ever approve Cat Fair's resignation as the principal of Callis? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, do, no, we approved her hire. I, I think we, yeah. We, we, we approved the hire. Resignation. And, and I, I think she resigned. Though, she right? yeah. resign no, no, yeah, because I asked me. We approved. No, she had to. Yeah, before. Yeah, you have to approve it before she could accept the contract. contract. Yes, 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 we did. Okay. Yeah, we did. <laughs> and it might have been a conference <laughs> time period. Too. Okay. It, well, yeah, I think it was. Oh, was it? It no, was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. Okay. She was at the end of one contract. Right. Which is different. Oh, those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay. 
change of FTE. Go ahead. I move that we accept the change in FTE for the following uh, Michael Close from 0.2 FTE to 0.8 FTE, the music teacher at U32. Christina Snook, the art teacher at Berlin from 0.2 FTE to 0.4 FTE. And Callie Weller, Callis Elementary School, has a combined pre-K K classroom this year requiring five days a week coverage. So she'll be moving from 0.84 to 1 FTE. Second. Mike. Okay, any discussion? Um, just a correction, Michael's moving from point 0.6, 0.6 to point eight. Yeah, I was, thank you. Yes, Michael's oh. point 0.6 to point 0.8, that's a typo. It was a and, point 0.2 increase. And, and is there an explanation as to why these increases? Yes, in the... Is it? Yes, there is. Michael's picking up point 0.2 uh, at U32. Um, you want more than that? So it was needed for the scheduling to be able to have him teach the number of classes that we needed here at U32 was to move him from 0.6 to 0.8. His contract had been 0.6, but we mm -hmm. had a 0.8 available, really. Um, just given some of the discussion we had in the spring in terms of cutting mm -hmm. some of these positions, I just want to be sure I understand as we're increasing them. So, so that position, um, we had it available as a 0.8. Mm -hmm. He only had a 0.6 contract. Um, so we were we needed to expand his contract mm -hmm. to fulfill the whole position. So it wasn't adding a new 0.2 to mm -hmm. the to the budget that you approved. It's just adding to his contract. Mm -hmm. okay. With Christina, did someone? leave to open up that point yes two. so she was also a 0.2 contract and is moving up to a 0.4 but that doesn't expand the number of <laughs> ftes in the district it just it increases her contract mm -hmm. and same with cali as well okay all those in favor please signify by saying aye aye, aye. 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 any opposed Hearing none, the motion carries. Change in positions. A motion to approve the change in positions. I move that we approve the change in positions for Tony Snow, Dean of Students at U32, and JB Hilferty, Assistant Principal at U32. Second by. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Daniel. I was just wondering if we could get a little bit of um, clarification around the different scopes of work, Dean of Students, Assistant oh, yeah. Principal, really cool. and the other, I think, Assistant Principal role that Kat is yeah. um, feeling. So could I just, as opposed to trying to come up with it all right now, could I put that together and give you in a future so that you knew those great. roles, yeah. what they were? Yeah. Thank just, you. That way I don't miss yeah. something. No, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, great. yeah and we've done that in the past to have mm -hmm. a job description actually come. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, well, thank you, Tony and JB. It's pretty exciting to have that combination. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think it's important. <laughs> JB was a teacher in our middle school. He moved to the Dean of Students position uh, for um, a, a couple of year, couple year. years. A year. I don't know. It all blends together now. And yeah. now he's moved up to uh, an assistant principal position. Um, so we're growing our own. And I think that that's a really good thing. Yeah. You see that. yeah. And Tony's know the same. He was doing. He was our, our rise, rise coordinator. Rise coordinator. And now it's okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. So thank you. Moving right up to the agenda, uh, the consent agenda. I'm looking for a motion to approve our minutes. And the board of the Okay. So, um, yeah. So, um, I, know, I know that you have moved to approve the minutes. Okay. Of June. June 11. Okay. Thank you. I second. Thank you, Elizabeth. You're welcome. Any discussion or edit? Seeing none, just thank you, Lisa, for always taking the best minutes. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. And now uh, our next one is to approve the board orders. And since you have it, you got the honor to make the motion. Okay. And it should be on the. <laughs> you got it. It should be. Go to the next page. Here. Okay. Yeah. So you can move the first. You can move it as a total, or you can move each. Okay. Okay. So I move to approve the uh, board orders. Um, the first one. I read this whole thing. Is yes. the uh, check check warrant general uh, with the date range of 6 12 2024 to 8 21 2024 with the amount of five million five hundred forty seven thousand four hundred and eighty dollars and seventy nine cents. Um, the second is a check warrant capital with the date range of 6 12 2024 to 8 21 2024 with the amount of $402,175.15. And the third is a check warrant general for uh, for the date of 6 6 2024 with the amount of $225.00. For a total of? For a total of $5,959,800. Sorry, for a total of $5,949,880.94. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, second? Thank you, Kelly. Any questions? Sure. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> time to start. Five million nine hundred forty-nine thousand eight hundred eighty dollars and ninety-four cents. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those. I did. Kelly. Kelly. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. All right, future agenda items. Uh, one of the future agenda items we usually uh, share on the screen, our, our work plan, uh, but we already did uh, part of that, which was uh, our next uh, board uh, learning. Uh, but one thing that we want to put in our future agenda items is our student appointment to the board, and Stephen is going to coordinate with the high school and with Becca so that we have a, so Linnea will be joining us again because she was a junior student and then we, we already have one student interested. Yeah, for the new board, board members, members, we have two student reps yeah. to the board. Um, they're non-voting members, um, but they are certainly informative. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they start a, a two year cycle as a junior and then serve again in their senior year. So there's always one kid that's got some experience and the other one learns. And so it's wonderful that right. we'll have our, our student reps in place as quickly as possible. A, um, or reflection about our meeting. Any? And just a comment. Um, can we, on the future agenda item of a meeting with Montpelier, um, to discuss potential future dancing together? Um, because it's been comes up over and all, over the, and over. Yeah. And I, and I'm wondering if there's misconception about uh, what a merger with Montpelier might actually mean, and whether. It, it's going to be this silver bullet that I think some folks think it may be. Um, and so to have that discussion and, and really put what the realistic parameter of a, a potential merger will could look like, I think would be very helpful for informational purposes. And, Thank you, and Chris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. We said that it would happen in September that potentially have an informal joint meeting with uh, That'd be great. With yeah. The, yeah. With them. Okay. That's what we said at the, our, when we reported from our meeting mm -hmm. with with them. So, just haven't established that date. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, but thank you for bringing it up. Any yeah. other board so reflections just on to clarify, today's meeting? Just to clarify, uh, you, uh, in okay. September we'd have a, a a joint board meeting with the Montpelier board to discuss that. To discuss that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But informal meeting, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and and just so that people the people understand, because we still have a few a few mm -hmm. minutes. If what what it would mean for us is not necessarily we already. When we have that meeting, we already heard from Plainfield is interested. We got a letter from uh, from Mark, and they're interested to be part of that conversation too, oh, okay. right? So we yeah. we can have multiple conversations going on uh, at the at the same time, and to uh, and we can we can talk at that meeting what it would mean to form a 706 speak exploratory committee. It doesn't mean that we unify right away, right? No, no, no. Then no, no. we will look at 
the pros and cons, try to do articles of agreement and what it means. That, and I think that people really don't understand, it, and I would just say right now, is that it's a merger of boards too, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. usually if you would have mm -hmm. a merger of votes, you would have representation depending on the population. So it doesn't, you know, we might feel really big that we have more schools, but our representation would be different mm -hmm. in a merge vote. Yep. And, and we would, you know, we, that would be part of the articles of agreement yeah, too. But uh, the work that we're doing right now wouldn't prohibit us of, of a future merger because we could have parallel uh, work going at the, at the same time. Because yeah. so. um, one of the things that jumped out at me from the Worcester presentation was the assumption that there'd be like a $9 million influx of well, money I, if, if the Montpelier kids went to U32. That didn't, I didn't think that that was right, uh, and so to have that I, I don't know exact figures, but I, I think the, the important thing, and you know, I know that we really don't need to respond to every question, but the, um, that would require them to close their high school and become a choice district that chooses right. to send their students here, which is, I, I can't imagine that that would ever happen. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, we, we would have to talk about it. a merger of two high schools is not something that I, I was asking around. I don't know that it's happened in Vermont in a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And so it's yeah. not just a yeah. next There's year. There's a lot thing. happening in Vermont right now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that, and, that one is not one of them. Yeah, and of course, of course, yeah. we did talk to them that if suddenly Montpelier flooded, of course, you know, we would figure out a way to to shift and, you know, it's not, it's okay. not easy, but of course we would figure out a way to shift and, you know, and they could tuition mm -hmm. all of their kids up yeah. here, right? That's part of being, you know, we know how to take care of all our students, but, merger but it would, a merger is completely right. different. And They're two different systems. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, the, right. the, from everything from transcripts to, um, to curricula mm -hmm. to everything, uh, you know, teacher agreements, everything is different. Right. And those have, if we were to merge, those have to merge with them. Mm -hmm. And so that's a very complicated process that would require a lot of work for yes. many, many years. Right, and it's not a dollar to dollar. Uh, it's, it, I, yeah. I, I can't even, I, I can't even fathom what the dollar amount would be. Yeah, right. yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Okay, so that was more like future agenda items. <laughs> uh, going back to board reflection, any happy campers? Okay. All right. Welcome yeah. back. Warm feedback. It's good. Uh, Feels like we never. Public. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we have time for public comment again. So if there's anybody, we don't have anybody left here. Uh, but if there's anybody online that would like to make a comment, uh, please raise their hands. I see one person. Is it you, Alan, or Lila? Is it Mr. Gilbert? Or no, it's me this time. Okay, go ahead. So I sent a letter to the board on August the 1st, all board members asking that you consider uh, reaffirming support for the current articles of agreement in opposition to any changes to the school closure process. You didn't take it up tonight. Uh, I would ask that you consider taking it up at the next board meeting. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Okay, and I will... Adjourn. We would just need a motion to adjourn. A motion to adjourn. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> Second by Amelia. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Okay. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Here they go. Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> right in front of you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Natasha. And thank you, Ursula, for taking time off from your few little time away. Okay. Take care. I stopped the recording. Thank you.